Praise the Lord. We welcome you to our leadership development tonight in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you and serving the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, because this great privilege you have given us, not by merit, but by just your grace and calling. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you help us to fulfill the purpose of our calling, the purpose of our choice, and the purpose of our appointment in Jesus' name. Be with us, Lord, and help us to be obedient to your word as we preach and expect the members of the church to be obedient to your word. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Tonight we are coming to an important subject, very important for our present life, and very important for our destiny. And it's very important for our ministry, because once we miss it on this foundational study, and on this foundational uh, practical scene, we're going to miss it all through, all the way. Tonight, we are talking about love in the family, Christ-like love in a godly family. And this concerns those who are married and those who are not married, because those who are not married, they are preparing and they ought to be preparing for them getting into that marital life. And it is the preparation that really matters so that one can lay a good foundation on this important subject. Once again, the message tonight is Christ-like love in a godly family. Godly family, not just any family. But the family that wants to be godly and the family that wants to remain godly and the family that wants to appear godly, not only in their own sight, but in the sight of God. Christ-like love in a godly family. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 5. I we're reading from verse 25. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Then he tells us in verse 28, in verse 28, it says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And in verse 31, it tells us, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Verse 33. In verse 33, it says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence, that she honor, that she respect, that she reverence her husband. As we look at this message today, Today we're picking up our memory verse. Our memory verse is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4, it says marriage is honorable in all, and the bed on the files, but all mongers and adulterers God will judge. It tells us then marriage is honorable in all. As we consider ourselves, marriage is honorable in young people. Marriage is honorable in middle-aged people. Marriage is honorable in even marriageable widows and widowers. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed on the field, it says, we keep the bed on the field, and we keep the marriage honorable and uh, graceful. But then it says, among us and adulterers, God will judge. 
That means then matrimonial unfaithfulness is damnable in all. When we say matrimonial unfaithfulness, we're talking about in every area of the family. We'll say matrimonial cruelty is damnable in all. Or we'll say matrimonial violence is damnable in all. We we'll read about that in the papers, and we we'll read about that, we we'll hear about it almost everywhere, almost every time. Maybe there is no day we open our newspapers without seeing one form or the other of matrimonial cruelty and violence, and that's damnable in all. Matrimonial um, infidelity is damnable in all. Not only that matrimonial deception, the man deceiving the woman, the woman deceiving the a man that is damnable in all. Matrimonial hatred is damnable in all. You see, there are people that they still live together as husband and wife, but they are not faithful to each other. They deceive each other. We'll say matrimonial hatred is damnable in all. If we're living together as husband and wife, and yet the purpose of that marriage is not being fulfilled in the sight of God. There's cruelty. There's violence. There's deception. There is infidelity. There is hatred. And there is neglect. Neglect, when we neglect the other person, either the man is not providing the money for feeding the family and just neglects the family, both the wife and the children. That's damnable in the sight of God. And also matrimonial wickedness, just sheer wickedness that we do not do to the other as we want that other person to do to us is wickedness. And so, as we look at the study today, the Word of God, we have to examine our own families. Because if we don't, we'll carry on. All we'll be saying is, I don't commit adultery, I don't uh, commit a wardom. But that's not the only problem in the family. So we need to look at everything holistically, completely, entirely, so that we will know by the grace of God as preachers, as pastors, as leaders, and as uh, workers in the vineyard of the Lord, we start the honorable marriage in our own families. Now today we're going to look at three points as we consider this important subject, Christ-like love in a godly family. Number one is the pertinent experience in the Lord for a concrete foundation. If you're going to have a good building and uh, the Lord refers uh, to uh, the family, the home, as a building. If you're going to have a good building, you must have a concrete foundation. You must have a strong foundation, a sound foundation. And so we're going to look at that part as our children are preparing to get married, as our youths are preparing to get married, and as other people, even in leadership, when some are getting uh, ready to get married, we need to look at the foundation, a concrete foundation, pertinent experiences in the Lord for a concrete foundation. Number two, purposeful expressions of love in a Christ-centered family. Now, after the marriage, we shouldn't forget that the central theme in marriage is love. And it is not just the love to satisfy the flesh, love in all its ramifications, purposeful expressions of love in a Christ-centered family. Number three, the perfect example of love in fellowship. Fellowship here between husband and wife, parents and children, members of the body of Christ because we are members of his body. And fellowship that goes on and leads us to an eternal fellowship. Perfect example, the perfect example of his love in fellowship. Let's come to number one. 
what are the pertinent experiences, important experiences we ought to have to have a good foundation, a strong foundation. We're told in Psalm 11 verse 3, the importance of a foundation. In Psalm 11 verse 3, it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If we don't have a strong foundation, a solid foundation, and a sound foundation for our families, for our marriages, and for our coming together, what will the righteous do? We must take care of the foundation and their experiences we ought to have, experiences in the Lord that leads us to this kind of solid foundation. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 19. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. You cannot limit that foundation of God. He has foundation, the foundation of doctrine. He has foundation, the foundation of a Christian life. He has foundation, the foundation of revelation and truth. He also has foundation for the marriage and for the family. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Haven't seen the importance of foundation. Now, um, you know, two people are thinking of marriage, or one person is thinking of marriage. What foundation should he have in Christian experiences in the Lord? Pertinent experiences, present experiences, proper, important experiences, indispensable experience in the Lord. Number one, there must be personal salvation in Christ. Personal salvation in Christ. If uh, you are thinking about marriage, and brother, sister, parents, if you are thinking about marriage for your children, we must understand when we're saying pray for the will of God, know the will of God. Number one thing, pertinent experiences in the Lord so that your child can have a strong foundation, personal salvation in Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. 2 Corinthians Chapter 6, verse 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Well, it talks about unequal yoke, but understand, if your child is an unbeliever, if your child is a sinner, you cannot say that your child, an unbeliever, is a sinner, not converted, must marry a member of the church who is converted. And then you say, uh, you know, when you bring uh, somebody who is a real child of God, wait a minute, your own child. That you're saying, if you go and bring a real child of God, is he a real child of God? If your son or your daughter is not a believer, and then you encourage him or her to marry a believer that's still on equal yoke. And if your child is a believer, a real child of God, born again, converted, transformed, living the life of a new creature in Christ. All things pass away. All things become new. If your child is a real believer and you allow her or you allow him to marry an unbeliever, that is still an unequal you. And in the marriage committee, as we help our young people, we must understand the Personal salvation in Christ is number one so that we're not joining people together unequally. Number two now is purifying sanctification with consecration. Purifying sanctification with consecration. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. It says in verse 25, Ephesians chapter 5 Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved. Love your wives even as Christ loved. The self-centered member of the church cannot do that. We need sanctification. 
the purifying of the heart. Before we can obey this commandment of God, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. It's the love that forgives. It's the love that gives. It's the love that thinks of the good of the other person. It's the love that is selfless. It's the love that is sacrificial. And we're told, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. While we say we're praying for the will of God, that is, our children pray for the will of God, our young people pray for the will of God, as they are praying for the will of God, is it all selfish? I want a wife that will do this for me, that will do that for me, that will give me this, that will provide that, that will provide that. The man is looking for a workaholic that will work and work and just be meeting his own need and is not thinking of, I'm asking for a wife. When I have that wife, I will love her as Christ loved the church. I will sacrifice. I'll be selfless. I will give. I will forgive. It's not factoring that. It's not putting that as a factor into what he's praying about. We must understand that a purifying, sanctifying experience is necessary. With consecration to God, consecration to Christ, consecration to the work of God, and consecration to taking care of the spouse and the partner when they eventually come together. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, that he gave himself for it. It's sanctification that makes you to give the very best of what you have every time, not only during the time of courtship, not only on the day of marriage, but you give yourself completely to the spouse and to the husband or to the wife. It says in verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And then it says in verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, Christ paid the price to make the church glorious. And so each one in the family with the sanctifying, purifying, sanctifying experience will want to give everything and do everything to make the wife, to make the husband glorious, not having spot or recall or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Number three, there's purposeful supplication with conviction. Purposeful supplication with conviction. Now, we cannot walk by sight. We cannot choose by sight. The best of us and the most intelligent of us will make a wrong choice because we do not know the future. We do not know the heart of the person that uh, we're saying we want to get married to. All we can see is the external smile and the expression of uh, being excited because I love her and because she loves me. But you see, if we're going to have God's own choice, if we're going to have a choice that will be helpful, a choice that will be profitable, a choice that will help us both in life and then as we cross over to eternity, we must have the Lord himself making the choice for us and helping us to say, this is my will for you. Number three then is purposeful supplication. You, you are making supplication and you are praying so that you have the real will of God and you have conviction. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Proverbs chapter 18, we're reading from verse 22. In verse 22, it tells us about the wife that we find. We don't find that wife by looking on the street, by looking on the internet, by checking on the Facebook, by checking on this and that. We get this from the Lord. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, look at this, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. How do we get favor from the Lord? The favor of salvation, how did we get that? By supplication, by prayer. 
and the favor of the goodness of God. How did we get that? By prayer, by supplication. And then, if you're going to have a good wife, you must make supplication to obtain that favor of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 19, reading from verse 14. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 14. Again, it's talking about the prudent wife coming from the Lord. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers. And a prudent wife, a proper wife, a good wife, a wise wife, a caring wife, a supportive wife, and a wife that fulfills God's ordained purpose in your life, a prudent wife is from the Lord. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, reading from verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 29, we're looking at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end the end the goal the ideal the good thing we have it says that's his purpose that's his desire and he's willing to give you that expected end but look at verse 12 in verse 12 it says then shall ye call upon me supplication prayer the prayer of faith the prayer with trust, the prayer with confidence, and the prayer with conviction. It says, then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, supplication, and I will hearken unto you. But look at verse 13. In verse 13 it says, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your hearts. The prayer for a good wife, a good husband, helpful wife, helpful husband, providing husband, protective husband. It's not a prayer we pray half-heartedly, but we pray and seek the face of the Lord with all our heart. Number four, there must be proper separation from old companions. If we're really going to have the will of God, I mean, our young people, those who are planning to get married, widows or widowers who are planning to get married, if we're really going to have the will of God, there must not be any association, any link, any connection with old companions. For example, we have gone to school. And we had friends generally in school. You cannot be studying in school and be isolated. But when you begin to pray for marriage, you are not telling the Lord that schoolmate, that classmate, that other person. Or if you were married, but your wife is going to glory. And now you want to pray to have a wife. Not uh, somebody who had been coming to the house and had been taking care. All that must be away from your mind. You are free from old companions. And then, uh, because there's no idol in your heart, you can pray. And the Lord knows that you are sincere. And he knows that you are free from all idols in the heart. He tells us in Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, it says in verse 2. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 2, here is what the Lord is saying. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What did he say? Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face in their heart. They set up the idol, and before their face, they see that every time, and they're daydreaming every time, and this is who they really want, and the prayer is just to justify themselves that after all, I prayed, but that must not be if we're asking the Lord for his spouse, a wife, a husband, life partner, that to do good in our lives, that God himself will choose for us. It says, they put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all 
by them look at verse 4 in verse 4 it says therefore speak unto them and say unto them thus says the lord god every man of the house of israel every man among the israel of god everyone in the church of the living god every man of the house of israel that set up his idols in his heart and put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet and cometh to the seer and cometh to the prayer warrior and cometh to a prayer partner and cometh to the prophet I, the Lord, will answer him according to the multitude of his idols. What does that mean? Verse 7, for every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separated himself from me and set it up his idol in his heart, separated himself from me. When you have an idol in your heart, and you already pinpoint that man and that woman, and that is the one God must affirm. It says, is separated from him. And you are separated from God, separated from the will of God, because of the idol you search in your heart, and put at the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and come to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Verse 8. And I will set my face against that man. He has idol in the heart. He puts somebody before his face, before her face, beyond me, above me. Is dictating to me, although he says he's praying unto me, I'll set my face against that man, against that woman, and will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord, in verse 9. In verse 9 it says, And if the prophet be deceived, and if the seer be deceived, and if the prayer partner be deceived, and if the one that is even making the supplication, the supplicant, if he be deceived, when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived the prophet. I have allowed that prophet to be deceived because they have not the law for the truth, the Lord shall permit strong delusion to come upon them to believe a lie. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people. And then in verse 10, in verse 10 it says, And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Very important then, as you are praying to know the will of God, clear all idols away from your heart. Number five is profitable skill and craftsmanship. You see, after the marriage, we have to take care of the family. That means before instituting or before contracting the marriage, you have to have a job you're doing. You have to have a profession. You ought to have finished your education and you ought to have your hands on a particular profession or craft that you are doing that will supply your needs and the needs of the family. Now tell me, if you cannot provide for your own person now as an individual, how will you provide for two people, for three people, that means uh, you, the wife, and another child, you, the wife, and three, four, five children, you must have something you're doing. There's profitable skill and craftsmanship. You look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. In verse 10, it says, For even when we were with you, 
This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Neither should he eat. Well, that's bad enough for an individual who has nothing to eat. It's worse for a man and a woman that has now come into his life. They have nothing to eat and they have to be depending on handouts and charity. Give me this, give me that. I don't have this, I don't have that. I can't pay outrage. I can't uh, buy food. I can't have this or that. Charity is good on the part of the people who are giving charity, but charity is bad on the part of those who have families and they become beggars and they cannot provide for themselves. In fact, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, reading from verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, For if any provide not for his own, somebody jumps into marriage. He dives into marriage. He hurriedly goes into marriage. And the people who are helping uh, to advise, to counsel, and to lead, they didn't check up, does this man have a profitable uh, skill and craftsmanship? Can he provide for himself? Now he's married and there's nothing to eat. But if any provide, not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. Think about that. The scripture says he has denied the faith. The Spirit of God says he has denied the faith. And the Lord himself says he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Therefore, we make sure that we're settled in a profession. We're able to provide for the one we're bringing into the family. Number six, pivotal stability of Christ-like charity. Pivotal stability in Christ-like charity. My brother, my sister, after marriage, the central theme is going to be charity. It's going to be love. And it's going to be Christ-like charity, Christ-like love. But if we're self-centered, if we're self-controlled, if we're self-willed, if we're thoughtlessly selfish, thoughtlessly self-centered, that we never think about the other person. We have not made that a pivot, a foundation, in a stable way in our lives. And we get into marriage. After that marriage, that uncharitable disposition will scatter the marriage. We need pivotal stability of Christ-like charity before the marriage. It's not at the marriage. We're looking for charity. We're looking for love. It's almost getting too late. Establish that love in your heart and towards people before you get married. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're looking at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Though I speak for the tongues of men and of angels, and I'm not charity, and become as a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. It's not enough that, you know, I claim to be saved. I claim to be sanctified. We can't see the evidence. I claim to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Look, I speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues without charity, without love, will not build the marriage. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have no charity, I am nothing. Charity is above every other gift for the family. Look at verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, but can be fanatical in religion and have no charity and have no charity, it profited me nothing. The central thing that binds the family together after marriage, one year after marriage, 10 years after marriage, 30 years after marriage, 
50 years after marriage, after the initial excitement of how she looks, how the man looks, how he carries himself, and the handsome thing, you know, as the man gets older and older, all those initial charm will vanish. As the woman gets older and older, all the initial beauty will vanish. And what you need that keeps the family together is the charity. And without that charity, the family will, you know, go apart, will scatter. Look at verse 4. The charity that ought to be at the foundation of the marriage. He says charity suffers long and is kind. They'll not say, why did I marry this one? Why did I marry that one? And now cannot be kind. Whatever goes on from the in-laws, from the neighbors, from, you know, any kind of immaturity from the man or the woman, charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. We don't envy each other. And it is before the marriage, the man should settle that. The woman should settle that. No envy in that. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. A person that is always carrying himself, carrying herself with the air of pride and looking down on everybody when she gets into marriage. When he gets into marriage, that kind of attitude is likely to continue belittling the spouse or belittling the partner. In verse 5, in verse 5 it says, does not behave itself unseemly. He considers his action. He considers his behavior. If I do that, how will the other fellow feel? If I say this, how will the other fellow take that? And because of that, he does not behave himself unseemly, uncomely. Seeketh not our own. It's not easily provoked. You know, there are people that, you know, they flare up and get angry at the minutest thing that might happen. And when that is happening at the courtship, a little thing, the fellow flares up. A little thing, the fellow sends an arrow. A little thing, and the fellow says, we're going to break up everything. Allow her to break it up. It's better now than when you get into the marriage. Allow him to break it up now. It's better that way than when you get into the marriage. Charity must be at the foundation before we get married, and after we get married, charity must encircle everything and keep everything together. It's not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. In verse 7 it says, Beareth all things. We need that in marriage. And we should understand that even before we get married, everything is not going to be rosy. Everything is not going to be on a bed of flowers. It says, he beareth all things, believeth all things. A suspicious woman, the suspicious man cannot really keep the home together. Accusation every morning, accusation every evening before you go to bed. Accusation as you wake up early in the morning. Accusation, how can you live in that condition? Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's the stability what to have as a pivot as a support even before the marriage and then it goes on after the marriage. Number seven, the powerful spirit, our comforter. The powerful spirit, our comforter. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You are led into marriage and you have the conviction, not confusion, you have the conviction that this is being led of God. And when thoughts come and thoughts come, it will come back to your mind. This is led of the Spirit of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are not led by what the man possesses, 
the job he has, the tribe he comes from, the encouragement of their own parents or the encouragement of other brethren in the church. They are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. These are the daughters of God. And these are the people that will have confidence in the marriage after the marriage is uh, consummated. And now you come together and all these uh, uh, pivotal uh, foundation stools are laid before the marriage, they'll continue. There's personal salvation in Christ. There's purifying sanctification with consecration. There is purposeful supplication with conviction. There is proper separation from old companions, and there is profitable skill and craftsmanship. There is pivotal stability of Christ-like charity, and there is the powerful spirit, a comforter. As we get married on this basis, then we can go on, and the marriage will be a successful marriage. Let's examine ourselves, examine the marriage, uh, you know, we are giving our uh, confirmation to, if either with our children or with uh, members of the church. We come to point number two, and it's the purposeful expressions of love in a Christ-centered family. Purposeful expressions of love in a Christ-centered family. Let's come to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives, you see, Paul, the apostle, as led by the Spirit of God, couldn't tell the Ephesians. You see, the Ephesians were Gentiles. They were not Jews. The Ephesians needed no godliness or righteousness before they came to the Lord. They were worshipping dumb idols, and there wasn't any exemplary family or marriage in the Gentile world. If there was anything at all, it was a marriage with polygamy. Anything at all, it was made based on uh, sacrifices to idols. If there was anything at all, it was, uh, you know, something they'll go and check out from idols. So he couldn't say, love your wives as your fathers loved your mothers. He couldn't say that. The only example he could refer to is even as Christ also loved the church. My brother, my sister, we make a great mistake. An unscriptural a thing that we do. When we're referring to our marriage and we say, my wife, this is how to do, this is how my mother used to do to my father. Maybe your father did good. Maybe your mother did good. But the ultimate example and the ultimate pattern and the ultimate model is Christ the Lord. It says, husbands, love your wives, now you are married. Whether you are together physically or not, what I mean is she goes to work and you go to work, the love is still there. Whether you are promoted to a high position or not, the love is still there as Christ has gone to heaven on the right hand side of majesty on high. Christ still loves the church. It's not a temporary love. It's an ongoing love. It's an eternal love. It's an unbreakable love. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Can you imagine a Christ loving us and never giving any word of promise? I don't want to commit myself. I may not be able to fulfill it. Did not give any word of encouragement. Uh, let him encourage himself. Uh, let them encourage themselves. They have the Bible. Not giving any encouragement with his presence and with his power. Not even giving any encouragement with any gift that he gives. He keeps on giving. He keeps on giving. He gave himself for the church because of the love and the model 
the pattern, the example he has called upon us to lay is the example of Christ who loved us and gave himself for the church. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, it says, So ought men, so ought men, so must men, so should men, so men have to love their wives as their own bodies. It comes to another level of love now. It says, you don't want any pain in your body. You don't want any sickness in your body. You might not even want to tolerate hunger or thirst in your body. Anytime there is need for the body, you quickly supply that need. It says, in the same way. You must love your wife, and wife must love the husband as their own body. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You can, you know, uh, turn that uh, verse around. He that loveth not his wife loveth not himself. He does not love his own happiness, his own joy, his own progress. He does not love to get to heaven. He does not love to please God. If he does not love his wife, if she does not love her husband, you might love a thousand people outside your home. You might love a million people outside your home and work and serve and run and sacrifice he that loveth not his wife, though he loveth a million people outside the home, he that does not love his wife, loveth not himself. He that loveth his wife. That's the foundation. With that love, you can go out now and love other people for salvation and love them for sanctification and love them for service. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. And look at three things. Now, number one, proper expression of love in the family. Proper expression of love in the family. You know, if we talk about love in the family, it's not theoretical love. It's not mental love. It's not um, kind of uh, theological love. It's not doctrinal love. This is practical. The person who is living with you can tell. Even if we try to hold any hatred in the heart, any malice in the heart, any reservation in the heart, somebody who has lived with you for one week, for one month, one year, he knows even from the shape of your mouth when you are talking, and even from the look of your face when you are talking, even from the body action or the body in action, the person can tell whether we love or not our love in the family. Husband to wife, wife to husband, parents to children, children to parents. Our love in the family must be in proper expression. And look at, uh, we're looking at Ephesians again, reading from verse 28. In verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Then it says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. In verse 29, verse 29 says that if we say we love, this practical love will be demonstrated. If we say we love, this practical love will be affirmed, will be recognized, will be visible, will be practical. It says, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Can you think about that? And since, uh, you know, you came to this life, how sometimes your foot will, you know, bump a stone and sometimes it might bleed. And yet, even with that experience, no man ever yet ate his own flesh. And sometimes your teeth might bite your tongue and it pains you. You might even see blood coming out and no man ever yet hated his own flesh. And sometimes it's like maybe, maybe you are playing on the field and you break your bones all the same. You don't want another hand. You don't want another leg. After that is broken, no man ever yet hated himself. Whatever has happened in your body, 
in your flesh, you keep on loving that flesh. In fact, the more pain you add, the more challenge you add, the more you love your own flesh. And it says that's exactly how to behave to your wife. That's exactly how to behave to your husband. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord the church. And then it says in verse 30, in verse 30 it says, For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. In verse 31, it tells us, For this cause shall a man leave father, his father, and mother is not running to the father, to the mother. Every time there's, uh, you know, something they discuss in the family, it's not running to elder so-and-so, and it's not running to church pastor so-and-so. She cannot manage the family by herself. He cannot manage situations in the family by himself. But when we're married, there is a level of maturity that comes with the marriage. For it says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. That will join and shall cleave to his wife that will cleave and shall be glued to his wife. It's like when you bring uh, two pieces together and uh, you glue those uh, pieces together, it's difficult to separate them. You're going to destroy one or the other or both if you try to separate. And that is the kind of union and the kind of fellowship and the kind of togetherness and the kind of unity we're expected to have in the family shall be joined to his wife, shall be joined to her husband, and they too shall be one flesh. In the sight of God, both are now one flesh. It says in verse 32, it says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning the church. It says, if you tear the family apart in your own local uh, community there, it's like you're tearing the mystery apart and you're tearing Christ apart from the church. It says in verse 33 now, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, he's talking to you now, let every one of you in particular, is saying, husband, you in particular. He's saying, wife, you in particular. Forget about other people. Uh, the family of uh, pastor so-and-so, you know, this is how they forget about that. And the wife of so-and-so, this is how she behaves, forget about that. The husband of so-and-so, this is how he relates, forget about that. I read about an author, I read a book, and in that book, this is the example they give, uh-uh, forget about that. It says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Proper expression of love. Number two is the permanent existence of love in the family. Permanent existence of love in the family. Well, already we have read the, the scriptures, the verses. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Even so, must a man love his own wife, even so must the wife love her husband, and you are joined together, and you cleave together, and you are glued together. There's no separation. There is no divorce. There's no living apart. The scriptural teaching of the word of God for the husband and the wife, as they have just got married, and as they have married for some years now, as they are counting years in their marriage, is that they are together. They are together. They are joined together. And they exist together. And they live together in love until death do them part. Look at Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, reading from verse 4. 
Matthew chapter 19, we're reading from verse 4. Here the Pharisees came to the Lord Jesus Christ and they wanted to know, is it lovable? Is it right? Is it acceptable for a man to put away his wife for every curse, at every excuse, for every mistake, for everything we don't appreciate in the wife? Look at how they ask the question and look at the answer of the Lord Jesus. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he that made them at the beginning made them male and female? The Lord did not ask, Have ye not heard what the uh, ruler of the Jews, Hillel, or another person, what they wrote about it? Uh -uh. Have you not read what the philosopher said about the marriage? No, no. Have you not read what the present day authors and the elevated and the approved authors of the land at the present day, have you not read what they wrote? Uh -uh. It says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male one and female one, making them two, one man, one wife. And then in verse 5, in verse 5 it says, And said, For this cause shall a man, one man, leave father, one father, and mother, only one mother, and shall cleave to his wife, only one wife, as you cannot have two fathers, but logically, as you cannot have two mothers, but logically, you cannot have two husbands at the same time, scripturally. You cannot have two wives at the same time, scripturally. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, wherefore, they are no more twain. They are not thinking apart. I think differently. They are no more twain. They are no more loving different objects apart from each other. They are no more twain. They are no more going in different directions. They are no more twain, but one flesh. It's like if a man, one flesh, will try to walk on two roads at the same time, cross two streets at the same time, ride two cars at the same time, and go different directions at the same time. Husband and wife, they are supposed to be so made one, so that they're thinking alike, they're loving alike, they go in the same direction, and they're providing alike for the family. Not that, you know, I love uh, Jacob, you can love Esau. I eat from Esau, you can take whatever you have from Jacob. They are now in the New Testament understanding, they're no more twain, but one flesh. Watch therefore. God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. He wants a permanent existence in that marriage. Number three, pleasant edification through love in the family. Pleasant edification through love in the family. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 16. As we keep the family together, as we're born in the family, as we hold the family together, and as we exercise the love we ought to have in the family, and we make sure that the husband is doing his part and the wife is doing her part to make every joint stay together, compacted together. As we do that, then we fulfill the will of God. There is edification in the family by what every joint supplies. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 16. 
from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love, building up itself in love. It makes us to be well grouped and to enjoy the family when there is love that every part, each part is supplying. In fact, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 21, it's telling us we can even live now the life of heaven here on earth. How do we have that? The grace of God from heaven, the goodness of God from heaven, and the pleasure of the Lord from heaven, that literally our lives will be as if we have crossed over and our marriage will not be like the marriages in this polluted world, in this corrupt world, in this evil world. It says, if we do all this that God has called us to, it says, it's so that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them. Look at this, as the days of heaven upon the earth. The Lord has made the provision and the Lord has supplied the grace and everything we ought to have, we can have from Calvary, from Christ, from the Spirit of God and put everything in place in our family so that we can live the days of heaven upon earth. Let's come to point number three now and it's the perfect example of his love in a fellowship. The perfect example of his love in a fellowship. We're coming back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love. Talk in love. Act in love. Think in love. Plan in love. You say you're introducing other words. Yes. Before you walk, you think. Before you walk, you plan. Before you walk, you meditate. Before you walk, you look. Where are you going? Where do you want to get you? And so when it says walk in love, you must think in love. You must plan in love. And you must project everything in love. You're saying uh, everything that is not of love, you push it away from your system and from your heart. If the marriage is going to be as God ordained and as exemplified by Christ loving the church, we must walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Christ has given us a perfect example of what our fellowship ought to be in the family and of course in the church, in the flock, in the family of God and eventually when we get to heaven. Let's look at three things. Number one, Christ's sacrificial love in our fellowship. Christ's sacrificial love in our fellowship. You see, if we're going to make the marriage work, the family work, we must always be thinking about not what do I get from her, what do I give to her. Not what do I get from him, what do I give to him. What do I get from the children? No. What do I give to the children? What do I get more from my parents? I'm working now and I have the wherewithal to take care of myself. It is not that we're still selfishly thinking, what do I get from my parents? What do I give to my parents? We must always be thinking about Christ who has given himself. Of course, when you give, you give with your heart. You give yourself with it. If you give money, but you are not giving yourself with the money, that's not enough. 
You give care, but you are not giving yourself or the care, that's not enough. You give help, you are not giving yourself or the help, that's not enough. You give the things that are redundant and useless and you do unprofitable for you. I can do without that. You're not giving yourself. Now, if we're going to manifest sacrificial love, what do I give? It says, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and giving himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor in verse 32. In verse 32 it says this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Number two is Christ's supreme love within the flock. In the family Christ's supreme love. In the fold Christ's supreme love. In the flock of God, Christ, supreme love. In everything we do, Christ, supreme love. The way we're thinking and the way we're talking and the way we're relating together. You're not avoiding each other. I don't want trouble. You mean your wife is a trouble? I don't want trouble. You mean your husband is trouble? It says we must give ourselves and we give like Christ supreme love in the family, in the flock, and until the final day. Look at John chapter 15. We're reading from verse 12. John chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 12. This is my commandment. It is not this was my commandment. This will be my commandment every day in the family, every day in our lives, every day in the church, every day among the people of God, every day this is the law and this is the rule that controls every action. This is my commandment that she love one another. Look at what Jesus said, as I have loved you. As I have loved you, it is always turning our mind away from people around us. And it's not saying, as Judas has loved us in keeping this account, not as Judas. It's not even saying, as John the beloved, as John the Baptist, not as another human being, that she loved one another as I have loved you. That's even for the whole church. That's even for the whole flock. If that is for the whole flock, how much more in the family? Husband and wife. How much more in the family, parents and children, that will clear from our mind all offense, that will clear from our mind all misconception, that will clear from our mind all the injuries of the past. How many years have we been married now? And after all these seven years, after all these 17 years, after all these 20 years, we're still remembering, uh, I want to remind you, this is what happened at that time, at that time. My brother, what's the matter? That she loved one another as I, as Christ, as loved you. Forgive and forget. Forgive and overlook and let love come to the center of the heart, to the center of the marriage, and let love come to the utterance of her mouth. Christ's supreme love within the family, within the fold, within the flock. Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, greater love as no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. A man should lay down his life for his friends. Uh, do you remember we, we be studying about the crucifixion of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ uh, these few weeks now in the gospel according to St. Mark. After Jesus rose from the dead, he gave instruction to that angel and the angel said to Mary, go tell his disciples and Peter, that he'll meet you in Galilee as he said. 
go tell his disciples and Peter in particular tell him all those uh, denials of the three times God has forgiven Christ has forgiven and Christ is not bearing grudge and Christ is not holding malice and Christ is not saying I'll not talk to you and you know turn your face this way turn your face that way go tell my disciples and Peter they all scattered he forgave them forgive that's marriage Forgive, that's family. And the love of Christ means that he laid down his life for his friends. He wasn't saying, oh, Peter, you're my enemy now. Look at what you did. He forgave, so must we forgive. He says in verse 14, in verse 14, yeah, my friends, if you do what I command you, yeah, my friends, if you keep to your wife, because Christ said he commanded that husband and wife should be together until they do them part. They are no more twain. They are one. And you are my friends. You are the friends of Christ. You are children of God. And you are leaders in this fold. If you do what I command you, and you will not do anything injurious to your wife, anything injurious to your husband. Love one another. And now, number three, is Christ sufficient love in all fullness. Christ sufficient love in all fullness. You see, as we come to Christ, we receive of his fullness. And as the wife comes to the husband, now you are married together, you are not uh, holding back anything uh, you receive of each other's fullness. In John chapter 1, reading from verse 16. John chapter 1, we're reading from verse 16. And it says, and of his fullness have we all received, brother, of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. Grace for grace. We thought, or maybe somebody thought, we'll have grace at salvation, yes, grace for grace. We'll have grace at sanctification, yes, grace for grace. We'll have grace even for service, grace for grace. We'll have grace at the time of suffering, grace for grace. My grace is sufficient for you. We'll have grace in every situation, yes, grace for grace. That's what Christ has done for us. That's what Christ has done for the church. And that's what is now the example is giving us, the model is giving us, and the pattern is giving us as we have received of his fullness. So we now with each other, husband receiving from the wife, wife receiving from the husband, children receiving from the parents, parents receiving from the children, and the whole family being united together of the fullness of we all receive. Before we even ask, the wife sees a need, she's meeting that need. And the husband sees a need, is meeting that need. The children see a need. And it's not only money. The children may have the way without the skill that they can do this and you know, do this and that. Like for example, the, the children, the young people, uh, they're, they're experts in handling you know, all the telephone and this and this and that. That the parents may not have of the fullness of your knowledge. Everything the family needs, what you can give, you're given without way crying and pleading and asking and begging and everything. Everyone, we're receiving grace for grace. My brother, if we do that, my sister, if we do that, everyone, if we do that, our families will be he families with heaven on earth, experience in Jesus' name. The Lord will continue to bless you, and the Lord will continue to uh, provide for you. He has all the blessing that you need to go through every challenge, every temptation, anything in life, and of his fullness, you keep on receiving grace for grace, grace for today, grace for tomorrow, and grace for all your life, and grace in every trial, every temptation. He'll grant you grace, and you will not die by the middle of the way. You will get to the end of your journey in Jesus' name as the Lord has provided for you to make everything easy for you to live the Christian life and to get to heaven. 
Can I, uh, you know, uh, counsel you? Can I remind you of the commandment of God? Make everything available emotionally, spiritually, physically, naturally, and in a cheerful way for your wife so that happily every day she'll be going on her way to heaven. My sister, make everything available for your husband. She'll be going in fullness of joy every day until he gets to heaven. And parents, make everything available for your children to make it easy and pleasant for them to walk cheerfully on their way to heaven, the children. Make everything available to make your parents happy that they are on their way to heaven. Don't make those parents sad as they are getting near the end of their lives. And let us uh, rally around Christ, get grace from Christ, and then give grace to other people of his fullness. Have we all received? Have we all receiving? And grace for grace, the Lord help you to be what you ought to be as a father, as a, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a, as a child, and as a member of the body of Christ in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now as we talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer that everything we've learned today, the Lord will grant us grace and we will be obedient to them and the grace of God will fill our hearts fully that you cause joy in the heart of another pilgrim, in the heart of your husband, in the heart of your wife, in the heart of every member of the family, in the heart of members of the church that joyfully will move on and travel on to our destination until we get to heaven. The Lord will grant you the grace. Tell the Lord, he'll grant you the fullness of joy and everything you need to make this journey to heaven for yourself and for your spouse and for every member of the family a pleasant experience as we're moving on to heaven. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for opening our eyes again once to see. We pray, Lord, all these things will be written on the tables of the hearts of everyone. That, Lord, all the grace we need, all the love we need, all the provision we need to take care of each other in the family and to take care of each other in the fold, grant unto us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the model of Christ, the pattern of Christ, the example of Christ you have laid down for us. We pray the grace and the desire and the passion to follow through your grant unto us in Jesus' name. Grant us, Lord, fervent love for each other, fervent love for the members of the body of Christ, and a kind of love that makes other people go along cheerfully on their way to heaven. Help us, Lord, not to be a discouragement to anyone in the family, anyone in the fold, anyone in the church, but to help each other, lift up each other until we get to heaven and see you face to face, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. God bless you. See you very soon.